Okay, well, thank you very much, and hopefully you're not getting too tired of me already. Um, so we're going to talk about weaning APRV, and um, I think fundamentally we need to try to remember that we started with CPAP. So in order to create APRV, we first start with CPAP. We're not really starting with uh, conventional inspiration, expiration, and extending the inspiratory time. Of course, you can think of it that way, but I think it's just easier to think of it as CPAP that happens to have a brief release phase. Questions from the previous session while we're waiting? Yes, sir. Uh, if you could uh, comment on uh, the APRB in the great in Supreme of Persia, as well as the former center you must have Yes, yes. Uh, so for many years we used it in our head injured patients, and uh, we find no difference between ICPs at all. And again, CO2 is. Uh, generally easier to manage if the patient's lungs are healthy. So again, the key thing is to apply this earlier rather than later. If you have a head injured patient, and now they have head injury plus lung disease, and their ICPs always get worse with lung disease, the uh, difficulty there is you are trying to balance CO2 removal to control ICPs, and of course your choice is bulk ventilation, uh, which is a higher rate, or hold the breath and let the lung recruit. Now, if the lung recruits uh, 12, uh, 24 hours, you may have high ICPs for 12, 24 hours. You may not be able to tolerate that. So generally, a rescue situation is much harder to deal with. And again, it comes down to, if you recruit the lung, you, you may not be able to recruit the lung with a brief burst of inspiratory pressure. I think Penny showed you that it really takes a long time for the lung to stabilize. So that's why it becomes always a question of, can you accept a blood gas and with the idea that the patient's going to improve uh, in 12, 24 hours, and automatically your CO2 will go down without you changing the ventilator at all. But in, I think in a head injured patient, you don't have that latitude. I don't think, I think it'd be hard for us to say, well, we'll let the CO2 go up for 12, 24 hours and the ICPs go up. We are collecting some data that we're going to put together in a publication of head injured patients and uh, show that the, the ICPs are, are equally controlled. Generally, again, the minute ventilation, we've, we've presented this in a couple of meetings, the minute ventilation is reduced, same PCO2, uh, same ICPs. So, but I, in my view, the key is if you're going to do it, do it early rather than late. If you're rescuing, you could have a problem. Any other questions or should we, did you have a question? Question, anyone? Okay, so we'll start weaning. And again, if you feel um, uh, any question and you feel free to interrupt. Uh, no problem there. So what we're starting with here is, <laughs> the machine's doing it by itself. Uh, we're starting with APRV, which is, again, CPAP. And here the patient's not breathing. And just remember that the, the idea here with APRV, unlike inverse ratio, is that we are no longer using a rate knob. There is no rate setting. The rate setting is, is broken in two pieces with the T high and the T low. If you add those together over 60 seconds, that's going to be your rate. So we do have a rate, and you can see the rate here is 10, but it's really the opposite of what a, a, a rate of 10 would look like normally. We'd have a much shorter inspiratory phase and a longer expiratory phase. So the only thing we've changed really isn't the rate or the minute ventilation. We've really changed the configuration of the breath profile. And again, the breath profile here is designed to give your lung essentially a static inflation, which isn't moving very much. And again, even though the pressure looks like it goes to zero, you'll see later that the lung doesn't actually move at all in EPRV. The lung barely moves. 
and you will get a tidal volume, and you'll get a lot of CO2 removal. So this is what we're starting from. So this is a patient who's post-operative, not breathing, uh, recovering from anesthesia. And at some point, the idea is to let the patient do some of their breathing. And you can see here, the patient is superimposing their spontaneous breaths. This is the portion of minute ventilation. This is total minute ventilation. And here is the percent minute ventilation. And we control that by increasing this block of CPAP, which allows the patient to do more breathing. And you can see the percentage is going up here. And this is the inspiration. And this is exactly what you want to see during expiration. It should decay like this. If someone is, is uh, bearing down, as we talked about using a lot of abdominal pressure, you'll see that their expiration will increase in the opposite direction. It will keep increasing expiratory flow. It won't just sort of curve back. But here you can see we're up to 50 some percent. And you know this is what we would do. And then we calculate their work of breathing. Calculate their work of breathing. If the patient is capable of breathing, then the only question really is uh, uh, if they're comfortable breathing. Because panting is not what we call breathing. We don't call someone breathing 50 times a minute or 30 times a minute breathing. We want them to look comfortable. So this is the spontaneous breathing we allow, not uh, respiratory distress. And you can see this patient is actually quite comfortable. And see, every time I increase this, yeah, there you go, I'm going to keep increasing this. What I'm doing here is essentially increasing the block of CPAP. So I'm taking the releases and spreading them apart to allow the patient more room for their own ventilation. And you can see the percent minute ventilation is going up. You can see also that these breaths, we'll get into a little bit more of the analysis of the breath, but this is exactly what you want to see. You want to see a very wide because time is on the, on the x-axis and flow is on the y-axis here. So what you want to see is someone who has power will be able to do this. When people cannot breathe or their respiratory mechanics are, are poor, they'll make a big effort, so the flow will be really high, but the base will be very narrow. So it's tall and narrow, like a, a spike, versus you know wider, and not so high, because high flow generally would mean the patient's distressed. So you can actually look at the breath and get an idea. And like I said, this is exactly the type of expiration you want to see. So, oh, now we're on CPAP. So you know, once you get to a certain point, now we're on CPAP. So CPAP with release, also known as APRV, became pure CPAP. It's just the elimination of that. And now you can see 100%, what's going to show 100% of the minute ventilation belongs to the patient. You can see, now you have a calculation of work of breathing. We like this number under 100. You know, many years ago before the RISB was used, the rapid child breathing index was used to uh, determine suitability for extubation. It was also used to assess work of breathing from the perspective of looking at something called the pressure time product and they have an almost linear relationship. Pressure time product is probably perhaps more accurate, um, but it also requires an esophageal balloon, a little more cumbersome. So here you have a relatively easy measure. We like this because we don't want to be subjective about work of breathing. I walk in the room, he looks good to me. Uh, next person comes in, oh, he looks very distressed. Let's put him back on what he was on. So we like to wean the patient and give them more of their minute ventilation as we did here, right? We went from 34 to 50 to 60% of the total minute ventilation. We're increasing the patient's work. And every time we do that, we want to say, are you breathing okay? Of course, they're not going to answer. They're going to tell us with their mechanics, yes, I'm okay. And you can see again, we tried to, to do that. Now this patient, obviously, I weaned very quickly. Um, but of course, you can take longer time depending on the patient, you know, because uh, it's clear that weaning does require perhaps a different approach depending on the patient. You know, we like to always say weaning is the same for all patients. But what's become more clear is you have simple weaning, 
which is you know typically any patient within probably the first seven to ten days, the deconditioning that occurs after that period of time really will affect weaning. So then weaning gets a little more complicated. And then of course on the other extreme, we have prolonged or chronic weaning, the very debil debilitated patient. You generally have to slow the change rate much, much more. Here you can go much faster. You know, a patient who's post-operative, healthy patient, you know, something you can, of course, wean them pretty quickly, extubate them, uh, but the sicker the patient is, the more sepsis the patient has. They have profound neuromuscular weakness. Uh, those patients may take longer to wean, and you might have to go in smaller doses of reduction and, and gradually give them more work of breathing. So I think the patients are also something to factor in when you're weaning. Um, ultimately, as we increase the percentage of CPAP, and we switch to CPAP here, our protocol is that we end up going to a pressure of 15. I think this is what we do. And again, I'm going to do this very, very quickly. So now that we're on CPAP, you really have one variable. The patient is completely independent as far as ventilation is concerned. So you've already weaned them from ventilatory requirements. This patient is breathing just like you and I. They don't need any ventilation. The only difference now is, that already stopped. The only difference now is the patient, um, sorry, I think this is, the patient is, breathing on a platform of pressure, and you're breathing on a platform of zero. So if I turn the ventilator down to zero, you would look like this. You would look like this, zero pressure. So, but you're breathing and maintaining your own ventilation. So here, we're going to progressively wean this down. Once we have a pressure of 15, <coughs> CPAP of 15, we go straight to zero. And we assess their breathing. We never go below 15. I uh, can explain why. Um, but if you have a spontaneous breathing trial on zero, we use the ventilator to tell us, and we look at this work of breathing parameter then we will determine if you can be extubated. But one thing to also remember is this does not tell you whether the patient can be extubated or not. This is looking at the neck down. It's looking at respiratory mechanics. Of course, your patient who has no cough may not be able to be extubated. So failure is, there's many failure points and you can't expect a mechanical indicator to tell you it's okay to extubate a patient. Many patients don't have a cough reflex, whether it's from medication, sense of sedation. So you just have to be careful of that, or secretions, their ability to handle secretions. We typically don't want to go below 15 because there's many forces in the chest when someone's supine that want to collapse the lung. And now to offset that pressure, you probably need more than five of PEEP. And so we, we basically test the patient for readiness to wean. If you go with the more traditional approach, what we find is as you wean the patient, their lungs are shrinking, and then finally they get to the point where they have no pulmonary reserve, and you say, well, let's extubate you, we extubate you, and then that's the final uh, part that finishes you off, and then you can't breathe. So we want the patient to have as much lung volume, and usually if they tolerate going from 15 to zero, you can extubate them. And we actually are collecting data on this. We have a very low reintubation rate, compared to using five and five. So I don't know if people use five and five for spontaneous breathing trial, but please remember that the original rapid shallow breathing index was really on no pressure, no PEEP, no pressure support. It was done with a T piece. And the 105 number that was originally uh, used is on zero support. And if you use five of pressure support, five of PEEP, you may reduce the work uh, by 30 to 60 percent. If you use zero, the work of breathing pre-extubation and post-extubation stays the same. 
If you use five and five, there's an increase in work of breathing after extubation. Uh, there's also a very, perhaps a good article that reviews this. It's called The Myth of Minimal Ventilator Settings. It's in the Blue Journal, written by Tobin. I think it's a very interesting article. You can reference it, many references, but it does point to the fact that we fool ourselves, I think, by giving patients more support, and next thing you know, we extubate them, and we're surprised when they're, they're, um, they're failing. So big difference in our reintubation rates versus five and five. We have many doctors in our hospital that still use five and five, and we're comparing the two groups. Roughly almost 20% reintubation versus 2% reintubation rates. So big, big difference. Yes, sir. Sir, Yes, 100% compensation and to the, the tube size. Um, the reason we use 100% because the it probably under supports the patient, not over supports them. And the reason why I say that is because it's very sensitive to the luminal diameter. So if you have a number, what do you guys usually use? Eight? Is that eight? Eight? You have a number eight and a tracheal tube. Could it ever be bigger than number eight? You know, could it be smaller? A kink somewhere? You know, when you take a tube out, it's not nice and clean. It has, you know, a lot of horrible looking things in it. The functional size of the airway actually gets smaller, not bigger. And of course, right when you're trying to wean the patient. So the endotracheal tube is very nice and clean in the beginning, but when you're trying to wean the patient, it's, it's horrible on the inside. It's softer, it buckles, it kinks, you've retaped it, you've adjusted it several times. So, so the functioning diameter is usually less. So that's why we always set 100%. Now it's also important to understand that uh, there's a big difference between pressure support and automatic tube compensation. They certainly have things in common, pressure, flow, but it, perhaps one of the key differences, and this is why in my view pressure support's not a good uh, mode to use, is that it can, in this weaning uh, phase, if the patient continues their inspiration, they're going to have support well beyond the tube. Because remember, the pressure support is triggered by the patient, and the flow will continue as long as the patient is maintaining flow more than roughly, you know, let's just say 25% of the peak inspiratory flow. So if the patient wants to extend their breath, they're going to get elastic support, not just the resistive portion. Tube compensation won't do that because it does not follow that termination criteria. And so it's really confined to the resistive load of the tube. I hope that made sense. Because the, what cycles pressure support off, it tells it to stop is the patient's effort. So if a patient is really healthy and has the ability to do that, they'll get plenty of support. They, they can take a four second breath, a five second breath, and at that point everything is going to inflate the lungs. So that's why sometimes it can, I think, fool us into, into that. Did that answer your question or did you have any other questions? I think this is what we were speaking about a little bit. Um, you know, our patients go through phases, and you can just look at your patient and understand this is not like the picture that the family brought in. You know, the family puts a picture and the patient looks like this. You look at the bed, the patient's very swollen, and they're not the same person. They're, we can't expect their respiratory mechanics to be normal. And if you view that the CPAP level is really trying to find that position on the pressure volume curve. So the patient does not need any assisted breathing. Then you would adjust the pressure accordingly and then say, this is the optimal pressure, this is the optimal lung volume for the patient. And now the next question is, what's changed from this morning to this afternoon? The patient's still swollen. The patient's chest and abdomen are still a, you know, a demon is full of ascites. We're still giving him fluid. The fluid's going to end up here, which means the compliance of the system is going down. Why would we drop pressure? And that's something that, uh, you know, again, I've, I don't understand personally. And I recognize that we do this against the main thinking, is that we won't drop the pressure initially. 
just based on blood gases. Later on, I'll show you how blood gases have no correlation whatsoever with how stable your lung is and whether you're actually potentially injuring the lung. You can improve the PO2 with PEEP, but the lung is still very, very unstable. There is no relationship between PO2 and, uh, or PF ratio and stability in your lung. So I don't believe oxygenation is a good parameter to use. And as we work through this, we rescue the patient, we optimize them, there's a period of stabilization. This is when you want to reduce the pressure. In the meantime, you can always wean them, wean their ventilatory perspective. Because you still have to do that. You know, you cannot not do that part. You can reduce the pressure all the way to zero, but if the patient's not breathing on their own, you're not going to have an easy time extubating that patient. You have to let them breathe also. So we just change the order. Most people would decrease the pressure and say the blood gas is fine, keep decreasing the pressure. But we're looking at the whole system and saying the system hasn't changed. The system's worsening. The system has plateaued. The system is now responding to diuretics and the patient's ascites is shrinking and the patient's chest wall is less edematous and the patient's been sitting in a chair now and their lung inflation is better and now we don't need as much pressure. And to be quite honest with you, what happens is if you look at the chest x-ray, you will easily see the diaphragm go like this. As you see the diaphragm flatten, you can reduce the pressure. Because we're, again, not interested in tidal volume per se, but we're interested in lung volume, which clearly is more difficult to understand and measure clinically. And we have to use surrogates, like how they're using their abdomen, what their chest x-ray look like. I mean, none of these are perfect, but then again, most of what we do is not perfect. So we're looking for information to tell us where, where to adjust the pressure. So we don't want the lung too big, we don't want it too small. We want the patient to be able to initiate a breath with enough room to drive up that steep part of their pressure volume curve without tipping over this way or shrinking their lung down and letting it collapse. And when we believe that we can reduce that pressure because they're getting skinnier and more like the picture they have, then we will drop the pressure. Um, so this is a patient I can show you. This is what I was trying to describe a little bit. You see how very tall the breath is and how short the base is versus that nice round, let's call it like a nice round hill. That's a patient who's comfortable. This is a patient who's making a lot of effort. And you can see their flow is very high. I mean, normal spontaneous breathing it does not have a, a, a inspiratory flow of 60 some liters. You should be able to do this without having such high flow. And you can even see he's, the patient's actually eroding the CPAP level. Can you see that, that it's caving in a little bit as he makes effort? So, unfortunately, I cannot precisely tell you if the patient is up here or up here. I can really tell you the patient's not here, if that makes any sense. Because if they're here, they're going to have that nice breath. If they're at the other extreme, they're going to have a problem. So when you see something like this and the patient's work of breathing is higher, you have to decide whether, let's say you wean the patient, you drop the pressure. This could easily be someone whose lungs collapsed and now they have more work of breathing and now you have to go back up. Or it could be someone who you weren't paying attention and their lungs kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Usually they exhale and you'll see them do this so they can always control their lung volume. It's not like intrinsic peep, occult peep where you cannot get it out and it just keeps going until the patient explodes. The patient's brain will always make them squeeze and you should pay attention to what they're doing. If they're really working on the expiratory side, you need to unload their expiratory work. It could be something in the tube, it could be something the airways are constricted, it could be simply their lung volume is too high. So you need to determine that they're not on their steep part of their pressure volume curve and you need to figure out where they are. You can look at chest exercise. You can look at their chest. If you walk into the room and the patient's chest while they're laying in bed looks like this and they're going like this, you know that it's probably up here. 
you know, if they're using a lot of inspiratory effort with their neck muscles, and there's a lot of movement in their chest to abdomen, and the chest x-ray, the diaphragm is like this, and collapse densities in the, in the chest x-ray, you could say maybe they're, they need a little more pressure. But if you look at the waveforms, you will gain a lot of insight, I think. And this is what we've been doing, is analyzing the waveforms for many years, because this is not enough information. This doesn't tell you the dynamics of the system. This is how this patient's breathing. And so there's more information in the waveforms. And now, you know, we're lucky that we have, just about every ventilator has waveforms. I mean, in the old days, I don't know if you remember, we were always using the Servo 900 for many, many years. That was our main ventilator, if you remember. This is what you got, right? Uh, you didn't have a lot of graphics. Now we do. Now we can look at, these are little pictures, you know. We look for these things to tell us something. We look at little signals on EKGs and say, oh, this person's having an ischemic uh, problem in their heart. So there is information in here. Uh, we look at pictures all the time. All right, question. Yes, sir. Uh, do you use APR in the non-invasive ventilation? Yes, we do. Because I see screen. <laughs> yes. Yes, we do. We, we do use it, yes. And so again, we have to determine all the things you have to do invasively. The, the nice thing about it, uh, what I would say, well, I can only really say it on this ventilator. You know, this, this particular ventilator is, is not a modification of, of anything more than, it's a very simple CPAP system. It does not have a trigger. So in this ventilator, it's a triggerless mode. And the reason why it's very stable non-invasively is that without a trigger, you have a leak and a trigger. Leak and a trigger means a lot of times auto cycling. So this will not auto cycle non-invasively, which in my view is an advantage because this is very, um, you know, most patients don't like the, the, the jackhammer of the, you know, auto cycling when they have a little bit of a leak when you use pressure support, for example. Um, so we think, we think it's very stable non-invasively. And again, the idea is, um, is to support their lung volume, but also ventilate them. So if you use pure CPAP, and the patient is very uncomfortable, <clears throat> not tolerating the mask, if you sedate them, you're gonna take their drive to breathe away, potentially. But here I can interrupt the CPAP and actually ventilate them. So this is the reason why we like to use this. If you use pressure support, again, you're relying on the patient to trigger, breathe, you sedate them or give them something to, make their stress a little bit better by having the mask on their face and all the anxiety that comes typically with non-invasive, you can sedate these guys. You can sedate them, keep them comfortable, and you'll still be able to ventilate them. Other questions? So, um, I'm going to show you this. Uh, Okay, so let me, uh, let me just take you back to the steps we do to determine this. And one of the things we want to do is assess their ability, their, their function of their brain stem and ability to control breathing. And the routine thing that we'll do is what we call, for lack of a better term, a stretch test. So we do this stretch test where, you know, typically your patient is on a T-hive 5.5 seconds, these are relatively standard. A T low of 0.5 seconds, that's six seconds. That's a rate of 10. And they're gonna have a good tidal volume. So a minute ventilation, five liters. Five liters almost uniformly will give you a PCO2 that's normal or slightly lower than normal in a healthy patient. So that's standard. So the patient's post-operative, now we want them to start breathing. But they also have lots of post-operative pain, um, you know, multiple reasons to give them analgesia and sedation, but now we want to know, are you ready to breathe? So we will stretch the T high, adding 10 seconds. 10 seconds, and then watch what happens. Now you notice the minute ventilation here is almost five liters, 4.8. Patient's PCO2 is fine. So we will stretch it, and of course you'll notice that the minute ventilation will drop, and there's no activity here at all. 
So if you can imagine the PCO2 is going up slowly, and depending on on the patient's metabolic rate, you know, it can go faster or slower. And now we have a little red box, and the machine is upset that the minute relation is low, it's making all kinds of noise. But we're in the room, so we never walk away until we determine what's going on. And I'll just speed this up a little bit for the sake of time, so we have more time for questions. But you see the patient will not breathe. And usually in three minutes, you will have your answer. Um, sometimes a little longer if the PCO2 is very low. If you overventilate a patient, you have to give them more time for their CO2 to get to a level where their brain stem is engaged. So this patient failed their uh, stretch test. So this patient has no capacity to breathe. Now, if you stretch the time, you know, another second or two seconds, your patient's CO2 will go up. And this is also a problem. People do this with APRV without thinking, if I do this, is the patient going to contribute any minute ventilation? And if the answer is no, your PCO2 is going to go up. You, you can predict that. You don't need to wait for the blood gas to tell you that. So at this point, what we have to do is, sorry, I'm not sure why this is here. We have to, uh, I'll come back to that. I'll explain that. Uh, we have to um, uh, negotiate sedation, analgesia. And this is when we will adjust medication. And our goals are really simple. We don't want the patient in pain, but we must have them breathing. So we don't accept someone who has no pain, but not breathing. And we don't accept someone who's breathing, but has pain. And as a result of that, we end up using different types of medication. Sometimes we get away with adjusting. We typically we use fentanyl, sometimes propofol, we adjust that. But more commonly, we will be using dexmedetomidine and ketamine, or the combination, which actually I prefer the combination of ketamine and dexmedetomidine. And that combination allows us fantastic analgesia. Uh, I think the stress response is well modulated. The nice thing is those drugs cancel each other out in terms of side effects. They're almost the opposite. You know, bradycardia, tachycardia, blood pressure up, blood pressure down. They increase secretions, decrease secretions. So it actually works uh, for us very well. And there's, there's a fair bit of pediatric literature on using the combination. But the nice thing is these drugs do not suppress the drive to breathe. And but we can have good pain control because many of our patients have a lot of uh, pain. Many of our trauma patients also have substance abuse and, you know, we come from Baltimore, and Baltimore is uh, number one in, or number two in heroin, I think number one in syphilis, you know, so we're, we're, we're doing very well there. But so there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of drug use, and so patients come in, many of our patients are pre-existing drug users. Um, so this is later the in the afternoon, whoops, five. This is later in the afternoon, and you can see we're gonna do it again. So we just adjusted the medications. Now I want you to see what the patient's doing. You see the minute ventilation still went down to the same, just about the same level. And now we're starting to see some activity here. And it's very important that you wait and make sure the patient is going to establish a rhythm to breathe. So real human breathing is not the patient took a breath over the ventilator, therefore they're spontaneously breathing. Or we saw the patient do that. Or we went into the room and said to the patient, breathe, breathe, and they wake up and say, okay, okay, that's cortical. You can, of course, control breathing from a cortical perspective. We're not interested in that. We're interested in the brainstem being the controller. And what you will see is ultimately the patient will establish a rhythm to breathe and you will see, you should be able to predict the next breath. Think of it as a heart rate. You would never accept a heart rate and then nothing, and then, oh, here's another one, uh, here's another one. You would see a rhythm. And it just so happens to be that um, that's the reason right there, right here, which is named after this German white wine. <laughs> So this was an area discovered. This is a, a rhythm generator. This area of the brainstem 
originally called the Botzinger Complex. You know, to two, this was in Washington, two groups who probably discovered it almost at the same time, and instead of fighting about whose name should be where, they were, they were drinking this wine at lunch, and they just agreed, let's call it after the wine. Of course, it was the wrong place. It wasn't the right place in the brainstem, so later, three or four years later, they had to change it to pre-Botzinger from Botzinger. But this is our, the rhythm generator. This is doing exactly what your heart does. And of course, heart rate and breathing rate are actually very close together. Heart rate, lung volume are very close together. The two work together. There's a lot of reflexes. If you take a big breath, your heart rate will slow down. So these are important interactions between heart and lung. So uh, when, the, when the brain stem is working, it's going to look like a rhythm that you should be able to put a caliper to. Here's the next breath. Here's the next breath. You're not going to see a big breath and then a pause and then a little breath. That's an intoxicated brain stem. That's a brain stem that's not ready for you to do any weaning. You have to have a predictable, you have to rely on the brain stem. So you need to see this, uh, this rhythm. Again, we didn't establish it here, but as you see, towards the end, not only did we establish it, but the patient's maintaining their own minute ventilation. And once they do that, then your question is no longer, can they breathe? Because in the morning, this patient could not breathe. Now the patient can breathe. Now your next question is, what's your work of breathing? And if the work of breathing is acceptable, why not let the patient's system breathe for you? Why do you have to rely on the ventilator? Rely on the human pump more. Yes, sir. Uh, do you have spontaneously breathing uh, only during the weaning phase, or do you have it uh, during the resuscitation phase as well? Uh, typically within 24 hours of admission. So many of our patients are still being resuscitated for probably three days, and we're letting them breathe, yes. But remember, for the most part, we're starting with normal lungs. And if you let a patient breathe with normal lungs, they will keep their bases clear for you. The x-rays are completely clear. If you let the lungs collapse and then ask them to breathe, it's much harder for them because it's really hard to reinflate a collapsed lung with a human power. We just can't generate that much power. So it's really about maintaining the lung in a normal state. And spontaneous breathing helps you maintain that. And of course, I think it helps your musculature and keeps your, your diaphragm from, from deconditioning very rapidly. So the idea, again, is to keep the lung away from adding to the patient's problem list because it's really quite common. Mechanical ventilation is quite common. Mechanical ventilation has a lot of complications. So we really want to use the ventilator because it's necessary, but for really the shortest amount of time. And if the human can do the ventilation without excessive work, why not? As long as they're not uh, you know, panting and as long as you have real understanding of what spontaneous breathing is and how it works, and the type of breathing pattern, I think you will find that it's, it's very easy to, to get this information. We typically sedate away all of this information. The brain stem is trying to tell you, this is what's wrong with my lungs. I'm trying to make my lung bigger. I'm trying to make my lungs smaller. And we sedate it away and say, we're not going to look at that. But here, you're, it's like looking underneath the sheets. And say, oh, this is what the problem is. And then you can adjust your ventilator and give enough flexibility in the ventilator to accommodate normal human breathing, which is not at all monotonal. It is not sort of one dimension of tidal volume and rate. That's not human breathing. So anyway, I think in the end, it results in, uh, in you know, a comfortable patient. I think you saw our patients are walking around, sitting in a chair, interacting with their family. Families are absolutely like this. Instead of the patient looking very peaceful, laying in bed like this, and the family's visiting and they don't know what to do, they stare at the monitor, they look at the patient, they stare at the monitor, they look at the patient. Now they're sitting next to the patient, and the patient's in the chair, looking at the television, you know, writing, doing something. Families just feel like, yeah, this is still someone I, I know, versus, What's going to happen to this person? Are they going to live? Or are they going to die? So I think for families, it also is, uh, we feel that it's a big help. That's your question. More question? No. Oh, okay. No problem. Um,
Yes, so, um, so we have a protocol because we do a study. Um, you know, honestly, uh, you can use every number of T high, every number of P high, and make it very complex. But what we did over 20 years is we crunched all our numbers. And it'll turn out that you really need four T high, four, four P highs if you do this early. Uh, typically, you need somewhere between, let's just say, start at five seconds, your next step is 10 seconds, your next step is 15 seconds, your next step is 20 seconds, then you go to 30 seconds, which is really just two big blocks of CPAP. And as long as the patient's breathing, you can do all of those things. And as long as you assess the work of breathing, you will know if you're going too fast or too slow. And it really becomes, honestly, very easy. The most difficult part, in my view of this, and of course I have a completely biased view because I do this all the time, but I understand that it's completely different thinking in its foundation. So we're, we're asking for people to think completely different. Of course, I had to do the same thing. I had my own problems in the beginning uh, because, of course, I was trained the same way everyone else is trained. Uh, but over time, I think you'll find, because CPAP is relatively easy, and when you reduce the, uh, when you increase the blocks of CPAP and it becomes just pure CPAP, you really have one variable to manage. That's it. It's much, in my view, much easier to reduce one variable. You're not decreasing P or pressure support and doing that. You're just reducing the pressure, assessing the work of breathing. Uh, you know, we use uh, other methods to help us. We, you know, commonly, um, we commonly will uh, make sure the saturation, we all use saturation monitor, right? Even though this is probably a worthless device. Many studies have shown that it's really of no benefit at all. Thousands of patients, no real benefit. And I think that the benefit really is to make the pulse oximeter not a saturation monitor, but a desaturation monitor. So one of the things we try to do is always use the lowest FiO2 and make sure the saturation is not 100%. Because 100% is not really telling you what's happening, especially during weaning. Because if I'm on CPAP and I go from a CPAP pressure of 19 to 17, I want to know if there's airway closure. If the, if the saturation is 100, the PO2 can be a huge range. And I'm not going to see that happening. But if the saturation is 99 or 98, and I go from 19 to 17, and everything's fine, and then I go from 17 to 15, and all of a sudden the saturation goes from 98 down to 92, I know there's a problem there. I know that I'm going too fast because we want to go as fast as we can, but we never want to outpace the patient. You cannot force the patient to go faster than they're capable of, no matter how much we want to. So you have to make sure the patient is with you the whole time. So they have to be right next to you, and this helps you. Of course, we also look at work of breathing. And this way, we, we don't really rely on a lot of blood gases. But in order to do that, you have to use the SAT monitor as a desaturation monitor, not as a saturation monitor. It's not telling you anything when it's 100%. So that, that just allows us to you know, see something at the bed, bedside in real time, <coughs> to, to decide on, do we take another step or do we wait? Because many times you might have to wait remove more fluid from the patient, perhaps uh, sit them in a chair longer because you're trying to, you know, as you decrease the pressure, what you don't want is the lung to collapse again because you want the lung to be pressure independent. Because once they're on CPAP, ventilation independent, but are they pressure independent? So again, we need to understand if we are going too fast or if we can go faster. Did you have a question? Question? Um, yes. Uh, could you comment on the differences in, uh, in establishing a success with APRV on different case mixes? Because I assume you see a lot of trauma, yes. which is uh, 
not uh, a big issue in Sweden. Okay. Yes, absolutely. We see more elderly people. Yes. Well, I have to say we're getting old too. 20% uh, of our patients are geriatric trauma patients. I mean, I have 90-year-olds, 80-year-olds, 70-year-olds. Uh, people are always slipping and falling and, and, and so on, breaking bones. The majority of our, our trauma center is the largest in the United States, very large trauma center, 8,000 admissions a year, just a very, very busy place. And I would say 70 plus percent, probably 75 percent is blunt trauma. Even though we're actually in a violent city with lots of gunshots and stabbings, <coughs> the bulk of our patients are blunt trauma and they're actually orthopedic, you know, because blunt trauma is relatively non-operative. You know, we're, we're embolizing everything, we're using angiography. And so the operative part is orthopedic. And so many extremity fractures, pelvic fractures, things like that, chest, uh, chest fractures, chest, rib cage, and so on. So those are the patients. Um, so they're post-operative patients. And I think the post-operative patient is an ideal candidate uh, because those patients are uh, going to lose lung volume and it's relatively easy to restore their lung volume if you do it early. So we know that going to anesthesia, many patients develop it. Uh, patients with high BMI is more likely to develop post-operative. Of course, in the US, we have our BMIs keep going up. <laughs> Sorry keep going up, so we have uh, those kinds of issues. We also have a very large soft tissue service. So we are a referral center for soft tissue infections. And these patients are completely medical from their history. We have a large multi-chambered uh, hyperbaric chamber, multi-hyperbaric chamber. And so we will have patients with diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and we take care of them. They have necrotizing fasciitis, very sick, typically septic with lots of organ dysfunction. We use EPRV on those patients as well. So post-operative patients, recessive, patients that need resuscitation. Later on, I'll show you some of our data is that when you resuscitate patients, you are going to increase the likelihood of them developing edema, lung edema. And lung edema, if you look at the uh, sort of initiation of lung injury, the steps involved in lung injury, relatively early on is lung edema. Lung edema is a very proximal event in ARDS. You get an exudative edema, the protein deactivates surfactant, the surfactant makes the lung very unstable, you have opening and closing, now the ventilator becomes the, a real weapon of destruction. So the sequence is very important. So we have data to show that APRV somehow changes the way edema is formed in the lung. And it confines the edema to the lymphatic space, the interstitial space, lymphatic. And you simply cannot make the lung edematous if you set the APRV correctly. So we have very little lung edema. So what I mean to say by that is anytime you're resuscitating a patient, you really run the risk of, of lung edema. But if there is a way to protect their lung from getting edematous, we may be stopping the whole cascade, or what we call the tetrad of death, which is you know, all these things that occur. Um, so, so I think a patient is being resuscitated, massive transfusion, these are the patients that we just, their lungs stay normal, or their lung edema gets better, even though we give them lots of fluid. Uh, so that's probably the, the case mix. I'll also tell you that, uh, in general, what I like to tell people is don't use APRV in obstructive lung disease, for two main reasons. One, I think you need to get comfortable with the idea. And two, everything we've just talked about, all the settings we talked about, are really focused on restrictive lung disease. You know, the more common that the lung is too small, and we're trying to support the lung in this position. We didn't talk about when the lung is too big, because you have the same problem. You want to get them on the steep part of their pressure volume curve. Here, we, we want to lift you up. In this case, we want to lower you down. And you can use settings with APRV that will actually lower the lung volume. And it really comes down to how you set it, the differences in the way you set it. So personally, I think it's a very good mode for obstructive lung disease. But you need to change the settings that we didn't discuss, and of course you have to be careful. It's much easier on a post-operative patient. I always, again, like to tell people, if you're going to use APRV, 
don't go to the patient that's half dead and then let's try it. You, you actually might need to do it on a patient who's post-operative, their left lower lobe is collapsed, you can't see the diaphragm, the right lower lobe is collapsed, and see what happens in 12 hours. That's a very easy patient to see what's going to happen. And then you'll be able to see them breathe and you'll stretch things out. Those are the cases I think if you're just starting are the best to, to act case mix that you would want to do. That answer your question? So it's very good at recruiting, let's put it that way, and very good at maintaining lung volume. So anyone who fits that uh, desire, I think, you would be able to. Questions? I, I mean, I think your questions have been fantastic, and I, the only thing I would say is uh, please keep asking questions because uh, this is the only way to uh, really make sure what I'm saying is making sense, it's clear. I, you know, have said things that, you know, uh, make sense. Yes, sir. Uh, I didn't really understand uh, the problem in the COPD and the COPD setting. Um, you have to. Uh, well, that, well no, we, we, can, we can talk about that. Again, I, you know, so typically, if you, you first have to start with, again, CPAP. And it comes back to what we sort of discussed with what muscles is the patient using. So a lot of work in the, in the early 80s was that CPAP significantly reduced the work of breathing with COPD. And primarily because your COPD patient is at home, having their COPD exacerbation, and they're breathing, and they're breathing, and their diaphragm is becoming very flat, and now their diaphragm doesn't do anything. It's just like this. So they have to use their inspiratory accessory muscles. So now they come to the emergency department going like this, and you have to help them. Their lungs are this big. Nothing is, you know, there's no ability to breathe up here. So you need to shrink their lung. So how do you shrink their lung with pressure? It sounds kind of crazy. But this is where you would set the P high, not to recruit lung, not to increase their lung volume, but to offset what's called the equal pressure point, or essentially their intrinsic PEEP. So if you measure intrinsic PEEP on some of these patients with severe obstructive lung disease, it's, it can be quite high, mid-20s, sometimes 18, sometimes 15. You just simply need that much pressure. That keeps their airway open, and then they can exhale. And because it, it silences their inspiratory muscles, as you increase CPAP, it forces them to exhale like they're pursing their lips. So now the CPAP becomes pursed lips. And they squeeze with their abdomen to shrink their lungs down. So that's what you're doing with the, the T high. Now, of course, the T high. Also, the longer you hold the T high, the more the lung unwrinkles. Well, you don't really need to do that, right? The lung's already fully inflated. Do you need to keep extending the T high? No. In fact, what you want to do is drop the pressure, remove some carbon dioxide, so the patient's metabolic work goes way down, because tachypnea is the enemy here. If you have a patient with COPD and they remain tachypnic, you're never going to shrink their lungs. I, I actually paralyze those patients, even though I don't like to paralyze patients. Because if you cannot control the rate, you're not going to control the dynamic hyperinflation. So the releases are going to be more frequent. The T high is going to be two seconds, maybe the most three seconds. The T low is going to be longer because the T low, the peak expiratory flow in people with acute restrictive lung disease is 60 to 100 liters per minute when you release it. And COPD, severe COPD, you're going to see 10, 15, 20. And you'll see this improve if you give them bronchodilators, steroids. You'll see the flow increase. And of course, the angle, I think Penny was talking about the 45 degree angle, you're going to see a straight line. It's going to be like 90 degrees. And of course, this is going to take much, much longer. So the T high is longer. The T low is longer. Again, you're customizing the breath to the patient. So you're looking at a percent of their peak expiratory flow, not 75%. It's between 50 and 25%. So I just gave you a quick cookbook, but there is a little more to it. That's why I'm always a little bit resistant in sort of just doing it in, in sort of five minutes. 
um, because there is a little bit more. But just to give you an overview of what you're trying to do, you're trying to set the ventilator to accommodate the mechanics, the prevailing mechanics you're dealing with. And again, you need to put the person on the steep part of the pressure volume curve. If you do that, they will breathe comfortably. If you leave your patient hanging up here or down here, you're always going to have distress. And if you can't figure it out, you will have to sedate that, you will have to paralyze that, and you have to control their ventilation with a machine, which is not the same thing as human breathing. Human breathing is a very elaborate. Ventilators, pardon me, Drager, inflate the lung. That's what they do. They don't breathe, they inflate. So breathing is just a whole nother dimension. So I would prefer the, the human version versus the machine version. I think it's just better. And the only way you're going to do that is if they're comfortably breathing. Did that answer your question? Was that clear to anyone? Because I, I don't like the COPD question. <laughs> you know, because you can, if you don't, if you, if you take what we talked about earlier and you use those settings, you will make that patient much worse, I promise you. Because we don't, we're not trying to fit all patients into one method. So if you use uh, general mechanical ventilation, you're going to do the same thing no matter what the disease is. That would be like doing a, always doing the same incision no matter what the operation is. So we have to fix this, but we're going to still do the same incision. So everyone's ventilation gets to be the same without any, any consideration of what's the problem with the lung? Why are they breathing poorly? What do they need to breathe better? What are the mechanical issues for them to breathe better? Yes? Yeah, I think it's also important that if um, you look at COPD on paper, on their uh, medical diagnosis versus on the ventilator. So they can have a diagnosis of COPD, but they come in and they have a peak expiratory flow rate of 80 liters. At that time, they're not obstructive, right? So, yeah. so you can have a combination and then maybe once the restrict, uh, restrictive uh, phase gets over, then they go to obstructive. But yeah, you, you need good. to diagnose the patient at the ventilator, not just on paper. Yes, and you know, and a little edema sense. in an obstructive patient will change their recoil of their lung. Even weight, when they get heavier, their chest recoil is greater. It actually helps their lung volume by getting fat 